Good morning, my name is Aaron and I'm a technical training specialist here at Manitowoc ICE. Today we are going to talk about refrigerant recovery in Indigo, Indigo Next platforms mainly, air water cooled, traditional remote and quiet cube. Uh, we're also going to touch base a little bit on the Neo product line. Before we begin, I'm going to point out that there is a question mark tab on the top right hand corner of your screen. You can click on that and post questions, comments uh, in real time, and there are people in the background waiting to answer them. A few basic recovery guidelines and disclaimers to start with. <clears throat> EPA regulations section 608 require that technicians and anyone who touches, maintains, services, repairs, uh, disposes of equipment, basically handles refrigerant, needs to be certified. No person is allowed to knowingly vent refrigerants except for non-exempt uh, substitutes, except for de minimis releases, basically when you hook your gauge set up, uh, things like that. R290A, along with most hydrocarbon refrigerants, are EPA 608 exempt, but it is still recommended that you recover them just as you would any other conventional refrigerant. We want to regularly inspect all of our equipment for signs of damage and to ensure that there's no leaks. Refrigerant's not only damaging to the environment, but it's uh, also expensive. Also, a few definitions we want to go over first. Re to, uh, to recover, that means we're going to remove uh, refrigerant in any condition uh, from our system and store it in an external container without necessarily worrying about testing or processing it in any way. Recycle is when we're going to clean that refrigerant for reuse by separating the oil and any particulates out of it using devices such as core filter dryers. Uh, this is going to reduce moisture, acidity, particulates. To reclaim is when we actually um, <clears throat> reprocess that refrigerant and chemically analyze it to make sure that it meets ARI standard 700 latest edition. And a new product is of course brand new product that already meets the ARI standard. Some more guidelines to go over. We're going to make sure that all we want to make sure that all the connections on our equipment are fully tightened and engaged. We don't want any leaks, of course. Uh, Manitowoc also recommends using an access valve core removal and install tool. It's the brass piece on the, in the middle of the screen there. This makes uh, recovery much quicker. It removes the core out of the service valve. We're always going to want to replace the liquid line filter dryer. No questions asked whenever we open the system and we're going to always ensure that we also pull a vacuum down to 500 microns. This is going to ensure that we have a nice clean dry system. If we're using a scaled charge, we're going to want to make sure that it's calibrated correctly and accurate to 10th of a gram. All Manitowoc machines are critically charged. They must be charged by weight. We cannot go off of pressure. If we got a scale that's inaccurate, we're going to have an inaccurate charge. Okay, to get on to the nuts and bolts, uh, here we have a diagram of a self-contained air water cooled, and we're going to have two connection points. Uh, they're both in the front of the ice machine. We have a high side service valve and a low side service valve. The official recovery process, as seen in your technician's handbook, which is a very, very valuable tool. We're going to press the on off button, turn the machine off, and we're going to want to isolate it from power if need be. We're going to install our manifold gauge set, <clears throat> the scale and recovery unit. And then we're going to open the high and low side uh, charging ports. We're going to perform the recovery according to the manufacturer's instructions of the equipment that you're using. And then we're going to evacuate prior to recharging. We're going to pull down to 500 microns and let that pump run for an additional half hour to ensure that we uh, clean and dry that system up. And we're going to also want to perform a standing vacuum leak check, make sure that we don't have any leaks. Uh, when we're completed with our process, we're going to follow the charging procedures that are located in your technician's handbook. Here we have a traditional remote. We're going to have four connection points. Uh, one on the high side service valve, one on the low side service valve, which are located on the front of the ice machine. 
One on the receiver king valve. Uh, it's also important to note that some machines do not have a port on the receiver king valve. They're going to have a third service port that's going to be in front of the ice machine uh, next to the high and low side service ports. Uh, we're also going to have one more connection on the discharge line Schrader at the Amer -equip, excuse me, air equip fitting on the back of the ice machine. Uh, on the bottom of the screen here, you can see pictures of these service ports. Uh, the third service port that I mentioned earlier uh, is on the right hand side there. It's in the middle. The middle port of uh, the receiver service port is the second picture from the left there. Depending on what machine you were working, I could have either one of those. For the recovery process, we're going to press the on off button, of course, to shut the machine off and isolate it from power. We're going to install our manifold gauge set, uh, scale and recovery unit. We're going to open our high and low side on our gauge set and we're going to start recovering that refrigerant. Once that refrigerant's recovered, we're going to pull it down to 500 microns. We're going to let that pump run for an additional hour this time, a little bit bigger system. Turn the pump off, isolate it, and uh, do a standing vacuum leak check. Make sure we don't have any leaks. We can also check for leaks with a leak detector if we have one available. Once we're confident we don't have any leaks, we can follow the charging procedures located in a technician's handbook. This is going to be very similar uh, process on most of our machines. Uh, on a quiet cube or CVD, we're going to have five uh, connection points. Number one is going to be the high side service valve on the front of the machine. Two is the low side service valve on the front of the machine. Uh, number three will be the receiver service valve. Again, on the front of the machine, we're going to have one uh, at the compressor discharge valve. That's going to be before the check valve. We're going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And number five is the suction filter access valve. On CVDs, we have a check valve that we have to be aware of. Uh, it's going to be uh, after the compressor on the discharge line. This is going to require that number four connection point shown here. Uh, if we don't uh, recover out of that connection point, we have the possibility of some refrigerant being trapped in the compressor, so we want to be aware of that. On the CVD unit, the recovery process starts by pressing the power button to shut the machine off and disconnecting and isolating it from power. <clears throat> We're going to install our manifold gauges, our charging scale and recovery unit. We're going to open the high and low side on the manifold gauge set. Excuse me. We're going to start to recover. Once the refrigerant's recovered, we're going to want to uh, pressure pressure test that system, uh, typically using nitrogen. Once we're sure that we don't have any leaks, we're going to evacuate and we're going to pull down to 500 microns, always 500 microns. When we pull down to 500 microns, we can be sure that the moisture is boiled off. We're going to let that pump run for an additional hour. Once we're done with that and we're ready to put the unit back in service and charge it up, we're going to go back to that technician's handbook and refer to the charging procedures. Here we have uh, some pictures of the recovery points on a CVD unit. On the left, you can see the ice machine head service uh, points, the high, low, and receiver valve. We see the number four in the diagram in the earlier slide at the compressor discharge service port, and uh, we see the suction filter service port on the right. Here we have an indigo uh, next machine. This is showing us where our service ports are. They're on the top there. On the left is the high side. On the right is the low side service port. You can see the control board, the compressor contactor, uh, and the power button on the display. Here we have a cool air, very similar, except the uh, service ports are right in the front of the machine, uh, right above the control board there. Compressor start components on the on off toggle switch on the bottom. Like I said earlier uh, in the presentation, we're going to talk about NEO a little bit here. A unique feature of NEO is you can pull the entire bin off and you can get at the refrigeration components. Uh, you don't have to remove the entire machine 
Uh, typically, these are under counter installations, so that's a really neat feature in the Neo. <clears throat> the access uh, the ref refrigeration service uh, valves, of course, you're going to need to pull off that bin. Then you're going to want to press the power button, cycle that machine off, disconnect power, isolate it, install your gauge set, scale and recovery unit, uh, and then open up the high and low side uh, charging ports. We're going to recover all that refrigerant. Once we're done with that, we're going to evacuate and pull down to 500 microns. Again, 500 microns. We're going to allow that pump to run for an additional half hour to make sure that we got a, a good vacuum pulled. Turn the pump off, perform a standing uh, vacuum leak check, make sure that we don't have any leaks. And uh, once we're ready to, we're going to follow the charging procedures located in your technician handbook, very similar to the rest of the machines. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jason. He's in the technical training center. He's actually going to go through step by step how to remove the bin on a Neo. Thank you, Aaron. Hello there. We're here to go over a bin removal on the Neo Ice machine so you can see how to access your refrigeration compartment. A uh, big question we always get on the phones is how do I get access to X component in my refrigeration system? Um, unlike previous uh, models of the undercounter ice machine, the bin on a Neo is removable. We're only going to need really three different tools today. I use a drill with a Phillips head. I've got my six in one. And the key tool that I consider that every technician should have with them whenever they're working on a machine is the applicable technician's handbook. For this one, it is the Neo Undercounter Technician's Handbook. And the procedure that we'll be doing is on page 43 of this book. The first two steps of this have already been done previously. We set this up so it's easier to see. Uh, it tells you to disconnect power. Well, we don't have power to this ice machine right now. And it says to remove ice from the bin. The bin is currently empty. Um, at that point, you're going to remove this front grill and the filter that's behind it. Next, we're gonna remove our bin drain. After that, we need to get access to our control box. This step is key so we can disconnect the communication cable between our touchpad and the circuit board. If you don't do that, you're going to rip this harness right out of the board when you try to remove the bin. Then we need to remove these tabs. Previous versions of our technician's handbook, this was a flip. Now all you need to do is remove the bottom of these two hex bolts. and then loosen the top one, and that drops. We're gonna do the same thing on this side. All right, we have taken everything off that we need to remove, so that way this bin can now slide forward. Notice now I've got full access. You can see your condenser, your fan motor, your electrical box. 
But the key about this training today on this webcast is how to recover my refrigerant. Here I have my high side access valve and my low side access valve. Whatever reason you're in here, you're repairing a fan cycle switch, you're repairing a leak, whatever reason you're gonna pull that gas out, you now have full access to work. Now I do understand that uh, one thing that's different here is I'm in a lab where I had plenty of room to work, but that's the big reason why we, it was important to manage walk ice to make this bin removable. Because a lot of times these things are boxed in underneath a counter with stuff along the sides. This gives you room to work. And to do, uh, once the work is done, at that point, all you're gonna do is the steps I just did in reverse. So we're gonna grab the bin. Not the easiest thing in the world to do with one person, but it can be done. Now, one thing that you saw beforehand is that white gasket. Uh, if that gasket starts to fall off, you're gonna, you're gonna leak uh, water because everything's coming up from behind here. So you wanna make sure that gasket was in place like it was when I put this back on. Get yourself pushed as far back as you can. At that point, I'm gonna put my tabs back on so that way I know I'm in place. These two here on the top are basically what's gonna bring this bin home. Get you that good seal there and back. I'm gonna reconnect my communication cable to the circuit board. Looking to hear a snap. I'm not sure if the camera picked that up or not, but that's a good way to tell that you're clicked in there nicely. Control box is sealed back up. Get my hose clamp back for my bin drain. Got my bin drain back on. And that's my first step that I did today. Last step, I'm gonna put my front louvered grill back on. At this point, I would plug my customer's machine back in, I'd turn it back on, close that door, and be back to making ice. Um, it's an important thing to be able to see some of these things. 
it is in the book. The book is a valuable tool, but a lot of people uh, learn by seeing. That's why we showed you today what we were doing, how to access the refrigeration compartment on a Neo undercounter ice machine. I'd like to thank you all for uh, watching my portion of uh, our presentation today, and uh, we'll send it over back to Aaron. All right, thank you, Jason. As you can see, super easy to get that bin off. Really neat feature of the Neo machines. We're gonna to touch base on R290 or propane now. You're gonna start seeing this pop up a lot more out in the field, not only in other manufacturers equipment, but also on Manitowoc machines. When we're dealing with propane, of course it's flammable. We need to always remember that. We're gonna to wanna to place placards or warning signs in the immediate area, warning people that there could be flammables uh, in the environment. When we're tapping into an R290 system, we're always gonna to wanna to use uh, self piercing tools uh, we don't want to be cutting into a system with uh, flammable refrigerants in it. <clears throat> After repairing, we're going to have we're going to have to have to put in access valves. Uh, 290 machines will not have service ports on them from the factory. Those are going to need to be uh, added. We're also going to want to flush that system with nitrogen uh, to ensure that there's no flammables left in there and pull a good vacuum down to 500 microns. After we're done and completed with the repairs, we're going to need to pull those access valves back off, uh, pinch off the stub, and permanently seal off the end. On the top left, you can see a self-piercing uh, tool uh, fitting there. Also, uh, all the process lines on a 290 uh, machine will be marked in red, uh, either with a simple piece of tape, like on the picture there, uh, or it could be paint, anything of the like, but they will be marked in red. We're always going <clears> to <throat> always going to want to remember to take those self-piercing valves uh, back off when the work's completed. They can be a source of uh, a, a point of leak, uh, a potential leak source. So we're always going to want to take those back off. We're going to want to also make sure that our leak detectors that we're using are rated for use with hydrocarbon refrigerants. Not all of them are. A combustible gas leak detector is actually your best bet, and they're fairly affordable. Here we have some pictures of self-piercing tools and service ports, uh, also a stub that's been pinched off. After we're done uh, repairing the system, we're gonna need to remove those access valves. Again, we gotta take those out of there. After that's done, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna pinch that stub off, re uh, remove the service valve, and always permanently seal off the end. We wanna make sure that we don't have any leaks. There's also uh, a fitting available uh, from lockering if we uh, don't want to uh, be brazing uh, stuff back together. If you're a little weary of that, you can use lockering tools. They're essentially a compression fitting. Uh, you'll need the special installation tool. Keys to success with these are going uh, to be make sure that you have those connections clean. They need to be very clean. Piece of sandpaper, emery cloth, uh, scotch bright, whatever you have available. Just make sure that they're uh, very clean. Remove all the paint, anything like that and also to make sure that you apply the sealing fluid that comes with the fitting. In review, it's advisable to, uh, to use a portable uh, combustion gas leak detector when working on R290. Not all conventional refrigerant leak detectors are compatible with hydrocarbons. Before we're brazing on a system any open or bringing an open flame near it, we're gonna wanna make sure we evacuate it and purge nitrogen through it at least two times to get rid of all those combustibles. Uh, two ways that you can leak check a system are using the soap, bu soap bubble method or electronic gas detection of some variety. Uh, remember, just make sure it's compatible with hydrocarbons. We can charge 290 uh, as a liquid. This will, of course, speed up your uh, charging time. 290 is typically uh, about 40 to 50 percent of a typical floral, uh, floral carbon refrigerant charge. Uh, we use less of it typically, uh, like for like. R290 has very similar operating pressures to that of R22. I also want to go over our refrigerant reuse policy uh, at Manitowoc. We, uh, we can, three, three different types of refrigerant we can use. We can use, of course, brand new refrigerant. We just need to make sure that it matches the nameplate. Uh, we can use reclaimed refrigerant. Uh, it must match nameplate type, and it also has to meet ARI standard 700's latest edition. 
We can use recovered or recycled refrigerant, but it must be from the same uh, Manitowoc product that you took it out of. We do not endorse the use of recovered or recycled refrigerant from other products. And we also want to make sure that that refrigerant is going to uh, coming from a contaminant free system. Was there a compressor blowout uh, was, or any other major failure? Was the system clean when we evacuated? Was it recharged properly uh, prior to this? Uh, is there contamina contamination of any variety? Uh, we want to make sure that we're not putting contaminant refrigerant back in a repaired system. Otherwise, we'll be right back to where we started. Another thing to note on uh, rotary compressor systems, there's going to be a third uh, service port for charging. This is so that we're not slugging the compressor with liquid. Um, depending on uh, the serial number of the machine, it could be before the heat exchanger on older machines or after the heat exchanger on newer machines. If we don't have a liquid line access port available, we're going to want to stall uh, a liquid line dryer and get one in there. We do not want to charge through the high side service port. This can cause damage. Here's a picture of a liquid line filter that has that service port on it. Uh, it's important to note that that port is there for charging really uh, only its primary purpose is for charging. You could recover from there, but there's no need to worry about recovery from there. Do notes on liquid line filter dryers. Uh, as I said earlier, we're always going to want to replace that liquid line filter dryer anytime we're working on uh, the unit. Manitowoc filter dryers um, typically come with a service port. You can get them either way, but you can get them with a service port uh, directly on the liquid line dryer. We, our filter dryers also have um, fiberglass filters on both the inlet and the outlet. This is important because of the harvest cycle and back flushing that occurs uh, during the harvest cycle. Of course, our dryers are of high moisture capacity and acid removal capacity. And we're also going to want to pay attention to the size of that dryer. Since our uh, equipment is critically charged, if you change the size of that uh, liquid line dryer, you could potentially change the charge amount. Of course, this is going to affect operation uh, of the machine. There's a few things, a uh, few fixes we can do without having to recover, such as uh, replacing a fan cycle control switch, water regulating valve, a high pressure cutout, uh, or a high side service valve. <coughs> This is going to save a lot of time, of course. Uh, we're going to we're going to need pinch off tools to do this. Uh, to do that, we're going to disconnect power to the machine. Uh, we're going to want to make sure that we know how to use the pinch off tool that we're using. We're going to uh, position that tool uh, on the tubing as far away from that pressure control as feasible. Clamp down and make sure that we got uh, a really good pinch off. We're going to cut the tubing of the defective component or switch, what have you, uh, with a small tubing cutter solder the new one in place of course allow that to cool off uh, take our pinch off tool off and we're going to reround that tubing using uh, pliers or something of that nature uh, it is possible we want to make sure that we uh, are aware that if we go too far we're going to pinch it right back off but we need to we need to shape that as best that we can so that we got good flow uh, up to that component that we're uh, servicing and of course we don't want to be unsoldering defective components. Uh, until we got that pinch off tool on, we need to add that warning in there. Of course, if you don't have that pinched off, you're going to have a pretty big leak once you unsolder that component. Uh, this concludes the webcast for today. We do have some upcoming webcasts in the near future here. August, we're going to be talking about using and converting thermistor temperature into refrigeration pressures for troubleshooting. In September, we're going to go over the sequence of operation and how that's valuable to us in troubleshooting. In October, we're going to go over cleaning a really dirty, heavily scaled ice machine. November, we're going to get into quiet cube and remote headmaster operation and troubleshooting. December, we're going to go over Indigo and Indigo Next event log navigation and how we can use that information to our advantage. And in January, we're going to have some new, yet to be announced, additional techni technical support resources. I uh, also want to note that there's a link uh, that you can use to take a quiz uh, regarding the information in this presentation. 
Uh, it's computer or mobile friendly, so you can use your phone or your laptop, uh, whatever you have available. When you're done with the quiz, you'll receive a copy of the presentation in, a, uh, in PDF format and a certificate of completion. Uh, you need to hit the submit button for that to happen. I also want to point out that there is a section at the end of the quiz where you can add comments uh, regarding the presentation itself or maybe things you'd like to know, see or know about in the future. We're definitely open to suggestions. We want to make sure uh, you guys are getting the information that you want. All right, time to test your knowledge. Here's the link to the quiz. I want to thank everyone for their time. We appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you.